Hey everyone, it's VM Campos, comic book fan. Welcome to another episode of the weekly VM Campos Comic Book Club. For the free audio version, head on over to your favorite podcasting app, Spotify, Pandora, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, etc. Search for VM Campos and subscribe. It's the best way to listen to the podcast on the go. This is the series where I review a comic book new or old from my collection and rate it upon the factors of cover art, interior art, plot, and enjoyability of the book on a scale of 1 to 5. Warning, I will be browsing the various pages of this book. Whenever possible, you are encouraged to buy the original yourself, support your local comic shops, and your favorite creators. It's worth it. This week I'm reading Mysteries of Unexplored Worlds, number four, published by Charlton Comics in 1957. Well, this is week two of October. It's week two of my series of horror supernatural comic reviews. This is a real treat right here. I have this original copy from 1957 of Mysteries of Unexplored Worlds from a publisher long gone, Charlton. And it's from 1957. It's got a cover, for example, by Steve Ditko. I inherited this comic. It was bequeathed to me by a friend who passed away and his family gave me some of his golden and silver age comics. And this was one of them. It is, uh, if you're watching the video, it is clearly been enjoyed. There's a corner missing. There's a lot of chipping. The 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 cover, the colors uh, and the pages are very yellowed. But this is completely authentic from 1957. This is during a time that the Comics Code Authority was in full effect after the, the time in the early 50s when there was a lot of violent comics, specifically crime comics. Uh, there were government investigations, no joke. The government had nothing better to do than to have Senate inquiries into our comics causing a generation of delinquents, our comics causing homosexuality and other deviant thoughts. And instead of waiting around for uh, government censorship, there was an independent body formed, the Comics Code Authority, that would do it for them. And so this comic is a reaction to that. It is much tamer than the comics of just a few years ago from EC Comics, the crime suspense stories and tales from the crypt and such. Um, but I wanted to pick this as a great example, again, as an early horror slash fantasy and supernatural comic to review. First up, let's talk about the cover. So it's a Steve Ditko cover. Steve Ditko was the co-creator of Spider-Man in 1962. So a few years later, he would be working on uh, Spider-Man and I think reach his greatest fame there. Here, this cover is um, a modern take on the portrait of Dorian Gray story. There's a little kid uh, looking at a mirror, but he's so old and decrepit. There's a variety of, you know, haunted mansion or decrepit mansion, abandoned mansion, um, items all over the place, tattered curtains, old busts of forgotten ancestors, burnt out candles, stuffed animals. So it's just a classic trope, classic stereotype. Even in the 50s, this was already referencing something from what, the 1890s? And it's some young kid looking at himself old. If you know anything about literature, okay, that's the picture of Dorian Gray. So uh, there must be some sort of related story inside. You are lucky. You can just read about it. You don't have to enter the forbidden room. These are the blurb on the cover. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times, covers have not really been indicative of what's inside the book but on its own i think this is a great cover this is a four out of five you have this panicked expression by the youngster looking at himself very decrepit hmm looking a little bit like Aunt May, actually and the cluttered scenery looks great the positioning of the camera so to speak where we're peering through a variety of clutter i think is a great way to create a focal point the logo of the comic is amazing. I love it. We've got Mysteries of in like a very kind of static font. And then Unexplored is very much more dynamic with a great gradient from red to white. And jagged letters looks kind of nice. So it covers cool. Four out of five. 
Interior art. Well, this is an anthology book uh, for um, Halloween every week this week. I'm reviewing some sort of horror comic, horror fantasy, etc. focused on anthologies. You don't have the, those as, as much as before. And this comic from 1957 was ripe during the time of many anthology series. Just throw in a bunch of different stories in a comic for your 10 cents. You gotta really make it worth your while. Now, uh, on video, everything looks very yellow because, yes, this comic is very old. It's been very red and reread. And so pages are very yellow. It's not mint at all. It's like a 3.0 rating, I would say. It is complete, but the cover is starting to detach. There's missing cover and a lot of stuff. But anyway, the interior art is several stories. There's um, two of them, at least, by Steve Ditko. Uh, there are a couple more, one by Bill Malno and another one by Rocco Mastroseri. So I'm enjoying the art. It's classic 50s, early Silver Age style. Um, the Ditko stuff I liked a lot. I actually feel it's better than like some of the early issues of Spider-Man, which came later. Some of these expressions, these characters look amazing. Um, great scenery and there are various twists and turns. Uh, panel layout gives you a good sense of timing and action. The other two stories, one by Bill Malno, the art is a little less polished, uh, less good than Ditko's, I feel. You still get a great sense of realism. It's got that classic style of realistic characters, uh, great anatomy compared to contemporaries of the time or a few years earlier where there was more naive sort of art in comics. The final story by Mastro Serio is, um, again, less on par with Ditko's quality, but you still get a sense of scenery. There's a car chase going on and you get a good sense of the winding road where it's happening and the characters have realistic expressions. So I'm going to say that the Ditko art, that's a 5 out of 5. In general, all of the stories, however, add up to about a four out of five. Really, the Ditko art, uh, there are some great shots uh, in the book, like when shadows are falling upon someone's troubled face. Coloring also works well. So for the Ditko art, five out of five. In general, four out of five. Next up, the story. All stories are actually written by Joe Gill. He's got a story, The Forbidden Room, which is basically a new take on the story of Dorian Gray, complete with a swami that creates a fantastical environment where the protagonist's uncle fears death, and so he uh, cuts a deal with the swami. But again, this is the 50s, so uh, the representation here of this mystical man from the Far East is... You know, nowadays it's not all right. Back then it wasn't also, but it was what was common at the time. And now we, we have to recognize that time marches on and so must attitudes. So there's, of course, a twist ending. All of these anthology books, all of these horror, fantasy, supernatural books had these twist endings. Some of them work better than others. Um, I thought this book, uh, this, this story was uh, working itself up really well to something. And then the twist ending is just completely out of left field in terms of it's being built up that this room is supernatural, that the room itself will age and you won't, but then when there's no more furniture in the room, you will suddenly become old. But that's not what happens at all. Apparently on some high off mountain somewhere that keep the keepers of the sands of time accidentally let a gust of wind take some time sand away and it turns the, the protagonist into an old man at the at the last minute and Philip had been had contracted this guy to act as the Swami who put the the, the magic together and it's just like kind of a weird mishmash at the very end. The following story is The Valley in the Mist also by Joe Gill. This one is about 
a uh, an adventurer, Sok Sorensen, who gets uh, hired by uh, some Russian scientists to go to uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, where they are thawing dinosaurs and saber-toothed tigers from out of the glacier up there in Alaska. And then, of course, the 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 uh, the communist turns upon the good American and wants to release all of those dinosaurs to take over America. There's a hilarious close-up of of Koreski, the uh, the Russian scientist, just sweating and with his red beard and bald head, just plotting. That is for impractical fools. No, I liberate these monsters for another reason. They will range south in your continent and terrify your soft, decadent populace. Then we will take over. Well, Sock won't have any of that. Here's a capitalistic punch in the jaw, Volkert. And there's a scuffle and so forth, and it looks like our hero might be in for it. But again, very abruptly, they're suddenly, they're escaping, and, and the scientist gets stuck inside of the glacier with his pets after he got betrayed by the other Russian, and it kind of ends like that. It's a tough way to go. He'll have his pets to keep him company for the next million years or so anyway. Trapped in the ice with the dinos. There's a prose story called The Wanderer. I kind of liked it in terms of it was building a world about this is in the future, space travel is common, there are many planets now, there's the Intergalactic Space Travel Society and so forth. And Professor Richard S. Falk is uh, trying to put together a crew to go explore uh, an asteroid that's only 500 million miles away from Earth with an erratic course. He builds his team, he goes to it, and then they discover that it was actually not an asteroid, but one of the first spacecrafts, the Monitor, who is intergalactic. That one also ends very abruptly. Those brave men in the first spaceship did not make a trip in vain. We have duplicated the motor used to drive the ship. Its first fuel was the insufficient Simpson pile. Yet that spaceship moved in the universe. Why? Because the stardust activated its motor. We now have a new fuel made from stardust. And the spaceship shall be called the Monitor Wanderer. You will forgive me for being personal, but the money I get from the new fuel will be used to set up a fund so those who wish to explore beyond may do so. Okay, so the scientists wanted to explore this little asteroid and it ended up being an ancient spaceship. And then now he's going to get rich from inventing a new fuel and he's going to let more people fly in space. I guess. Voices from the Dark is pretty bad. It's got a guy cowering in an abandoned shack and he's having memories of always being an ignored kid and just having a bad life growing up that his parents ignored him. He keeps hearing voices in the present, people calling him, Teddy, Teddy, here you are, Teddy. And it kind of shocks him back to reality, but then he keeps remembering, yeah, I always was ignored all, all my life. Then we have a segue that he's a scientist working with parallel universes, and his machine will let you travel to parallel universes, but he accidentally turns it on and he thinks he follows inside, but maybe not. But then, of course, as, as the reader, we realize, yeah, he fell through the other dimension, everyone's ignoring him. Well, he doesn't realize that, and it gets so bad, he then runs away from society, and it loops back to the beginning of the book that he's an outcast out in the like abandoned houses but people keep calling his name teddy teddy here i am i'm coming as fast as i can i need you help i'm falling into the pit he then wakes up and his wife tells him he's been in a coma for six months and and he asks well you were calling me teddy how did you know my nickname when i was a child was teddy well the final panel is a kid playing with a dog here teddy come back here teddy what parallel universes comas machines Hobos, dogs, I don't I don't get it. The last story is kind of interesting, again by Joe Gill, at the end of the road. Basically, long story short, there's an alien who has been undercover on Earth for 300 years. He miscalculated and his face starts melting because his human makeup would last 300 years. Well, apparently uh, he miscalculated and his face starts to melt in front of a group of, of people. Where we, where we learn fear and panic always crowd in on men who see something they do not understand. So everyone freaks out for a moment and then they're like, hey, get him. So they chase him away. The alien, 
Namo remembers that he was sent by Luki to come to Earth 300 years ago and that his makeup would last 300 years. And wouldn't you know it, he ran out of time and it disappeared in front of everyone. So he was on a mission to examine Earth for 300 years to determine if the if the Earthlings are peace peaceful. Well, the ending of the of that story, I made it. What the Earthlings thought was one of their giant trees was actually my spacecraft. My people shall know that the Earthlings are peaceable. He was he just spent this whole story getting chased violently by two scared Earthmen, and he had to avoid them by being basically going off a cliff where then he can blast off in his tree-like spaceship. And he's still gonna report after 300 years, the Earth people are peaceable. Now, I'm a liberal optimist at heart, and I think everything will work out. But this alien has determined within the past 300 years, from the 1700s to the 1900s, that the Earthmen are peaceable, even though his very last encounter is that some not peaceable Earthmen are trying to kill him or get him or whatever. And then that ends. All of this is to say is that in general, um, the the Ditko stories again are pretty fun. It's all the same author, Joe Gill, but those early stories, those first couple of stories, I think were pretty fun, four out of five. But overall, in general, everything else was like a two out of five. Uh, very juvenile, very abrupt stories, very odd settings. In general, two out of five. But the Steve Ditko, Joe Gill stuff, that's a four out of five. And lastly, the enjoyability of the book uh, for like what it is. This is a five out of five. This is a, a book, an original comic book from 1957, well read, passed on through the generations, eventually ending up in my collection. It's very beat up, but there's a history in this book. It has been around for 63 years and now it's in my collection. So for that, it's a five out of five. It's not the oldest comic that I own, for a long time, my oldest comic was Dynamo Number no. 1 from 1966. And then the last several years, I started to look into getting older comics because there's an interesting history and connection to have with an old comic book. At Comic-Con a few years ago, I bought an issue of Tom and Jerry from Dell Comics in 1957. So that was an old comic, the oldest comic I had up to that time. Dynamo No. 1 was from 1966. That Tom and Jerry book was from 1957. This one's also from 1957, so it ties it. I went to San Diego Comic Fest and I was browsing the Golden Age books there and I ended up buying a copy of Popular Comics number 138 from 1947. So that is currently my oldest comic book from 1947. Popular Comics number 138 featuring Felix the Cat. Discounting the nostalgia and the history and such, I would rate the book a 4 out of 5 then. It's enjoyable, it's kind of cool to look at old comics once in a while. And being on topic of this is October, let's talk about an old classic horror fantasy supernatural book. So that was pretty fun. So again, if you'd like to hear the audio version, maybe the version that you can listen on the road, on your drive, doing your chores and laundry. Head on over to your favorite podcasting app. I'm on all of them. Stitcher, Google Play, Pandora, Spotify, all of them. Just search for VM Campos and subscribe. Also, perhaps go over to patreon.com slash VM Campos where you'll get exclusive access to stuff for as little as $1. At the $2 range, I'll actually mail you a vintage comic from my collection that I think you'll enjoy. Or why not just follow on Patreon? That's free and you still get alerted to all of the content I create. I think it's worth it. So this week I read Mysteries of Unexplored Worlds, published by Charlton Comics in 1957. This has been the weekly VM Campos Comic Book Club, and I'll see you next week.